Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to WB Church Live on Facebook. We're so glad you joined us. My name is Paul Chin, Director of Missional Engagement at WB. And I'm your host for the next 40 minutes. Uh, today we have Linda Fleming uh, and Bob Laguerrier with us. They've been members of WB for many years. Hey, Linda. Oh, hey, Bob. Linda. So good to see you. Thank you for having us. And of course, Chris Stevens, lead pastor of WMB. Hi, everyone. So great to be with you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, really encourage you as you're joining us, uh, let us know that you're here in the chat, um, in the comments. Uh, we'll be able to, to see that you've joined us through that way. Um, just wanted to let you know what's happening for this season of Lent that's leading up to Easter. We're in a series uh, at WMB called In the Midst of Suffering. It's on the book of Job. Uh, it's an Old Testament book. And it's a book that's full of suffering and trying to understand how God meets us in suffering. And so we're, we're, we're journeying through this as we lead up to Easter, where we hear about Christ's suffering and the hope that comes because of the resurrection. And so we want to learn, we want to engage in, in, in stories of people that are grieving and suffering or have, um, but also how God has met us in that. And so I encourage you, if you're watching this, to, to like this com the post to comment on it. Uh, if you have questions for us uh, this morning, uh, please ask those, but also to share this post with others that you think uh, may benefit from hearing about uh, the story of how God meets us in the midst of our, our challenges. Uh, just uh, by way of announcement, I encourage you to join our, our, our Facebook group. Um, that is uh, our WMB, if you, if you call uh, WMB home, Please join our community, and that way you can engage. There's opportunities there for, for prayer, for connection, um, but also to hear about uh, what Jesus is doing in our community in this time. Um, so, Bob and Linda, would you give us a bit of an overview of who you are, wh what situation you're in now during COVID, you know, how long you've been at WB. Yeah, let's get to know you a bit. Uh, well, we've been at water at uh, WMB since 1987, so yes. long wow. before the, uh, the the addition. And uh, we really, I think, as soon as we walked into the doors there, we felt uh, we felt very much at home, and our boys loved it. And and so we became uh, part of WMB family. For, we've been there for a long time. I currently am, am still working in the field of uh, working with seniors, uh, doing caregiver programs. So I've had a long history of all kinds of human service, but this is where uh, I've landed now and absolutely love it. So I'm continuing to work and... Yeah, well, I've stopped that stuff. So <laughs> I've given up on work. <laughs> My course, about, I retired uh, about two and a half years ago. Yeah. And uh, so what I'm doing now is to, I'm just doing the things I want to do. Um, I have a lot of hobbies and, and it gives me a ton of opportunity to just help others in the community. Yeah. yeah. I think you were at the church almost every day when you first <laughs> retired, bro. <laughs> I appreciated all the work you were doing. <laughs> I think everybody did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, you know, in a typical year, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you would have been behind the griddle. Flipping pancakes. For our annual pancake supper, that's the thing that people. Well, a lot of people will see you there, both of you there, doing that. Yeah. And so, uh, we're uh, we're sad that that didn't happen this year. But uh, yeah, every year it's yeah. been a, a time for celebration, uh, for sure. Yeah, one of the many many things that Bob's cooked for, uh, prep for, planned for, cooking uh, classes. Yeah. All that. Uh, yeah. I think lots of my different events that I was running, Bob was the one behind the counter bringing in the soup and feeding everybody and, <laughs> and taking, practicing the gift of hospitality. So, and I love doing it. So it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's a labor of love. So. Yeah. yeah. And uh, right now you guys, we'd normally be going into eConnect Learn and Linda, you might be teaching a course on yeah. here for people and Bob would be in the kitchen and, Lots of things you guys have done and, and really served well at WFB, and we appreciate you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Thanks. So we're talking about um, discerning wisdom in the midst of suffering. And 
Uh, we'll get to your story in a second, but Chris, do you want to give just a high level overview of what you spoke about on Sunday, the big yeah. idea? We covered a lot of chapters on Sunday in the book of Job. We kind of went uh, through and we talked about how Job's friends first reacted to his suffering and how incredible it was that they came and they sat with him and they mourned with him and wept with him and just were the kind of friends we all want to have that uh, see us in pain and walk with us in the midst of our pain. And I know that's part of Bob and Linda's story. Uh, the first time I heard their story uh, was actually with some of their great friends, Kathy and Steve, uh, and Faith and Ray Morphy. And uh, again, I, I heard it um, in our uh, November uh, service on grief and uh, that we call Blue Christmas. But uh, it's a story that I've been deeply impacted by. Uh, and I got to say, you know, our, one of the many stories at our church that I thought of in preparing that message on Sunday about how sometimes people can walk really well in the church with people. And, uh, and we saw with Job's friends, but we also saw another side with Job's friends where uh, they acted really poorly, where they started criticizing and judging. And I had to kind of admit, hey, I too can find myself on both sides of that conversation where sometimes it's good uh and my reaction is good with friends and sometimes i i maybe not the best friend and so how do we discern with our friends where god is leading how god would want us to respond in the midst of suffering and i think bob and linda are going to teach us a lot about that today yeah yeah looking forward to that thanks chris appreciate that so uh linda and bob um just wanted to give you some space to tell your story and you know we recognize that this is an ongoing story um, and there's no right or wrong answers here. We just want to learn from your experience and, and to, uh, from whatever you're willing to share. And so um, we'll give you the floor and take as long as you need to tell the story that you have for us. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. And, and uh, you know, it's not the first time we've told this story, but it's, it also gives us that opportunity as, as we've lost Philip in our life to keep him in our lives. And that's one of the things that, that we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. But just to give you a little bit of context and a little bit of uh, who Philip is, because many of you didn't actually know him, but many people that might be listening may. Um, Philip was our uh, second child. We had Christian who was only uh, 14 months and along came Philip. So they were very, very close in age. And so um, here I am with kind of like with, with two kids. He was, um, he was a little hard to, to, um, to keep contented, but as long as he was held, as long as he was um, uh, rocked, he, he, um, he flourished and he um, just loved his older brother. So the two of them became very, very close. Um, and so as, as the boys grew, we could see their different personalities and so forth. Um, passions that Philip had were things that we knew, but maybe other people did because he was very shy. He was very introverted, yet he was amazingly creative. For instance, with artwork as a young boy, and I can remember in grade one, Christian came home or no, I guess Christian was in two and, and Philip was in one and Christian came home all excited because Philip won this, um, this art award, but we would not have heard that from Philip. Oh. He kept everything to himself. So for instance, in swimming, he was an amazing swimmer. Both boys were in row competitive swimming. And the first, um, the first competition, um, he said to us, I'm not doing that. And we said, um, okay. And we tried to, you know, and then we told the coach and they said, but he has to, he's the fastest. And it was this big competition in St. Catharines and, you know, Christian was going no problem, but there was no way. And, and we told the coach, if you want to encourage him, uh, go by all means, but we're going to support whatever he wants. So he did not go. We went to St. Catharines. He sat, in the um the stage the stands with us 
And what I didn't know, what Bob told me was they always put the fastest person in the middle row. So you get this V effect. So when his meet was on, the middle row was empty. Oh. They had hoped that he would do it, but he wouldn't. So they ran the race with the middle row empty, but he um, he didn't want the attention. That was sort of something about Philip in terms of being that um, that reserved. Um, growing up, we were like all of you, a normal family. And, and Chris, I remember you saying last week, you know, um, you know, you know, people said, oh, this is a good family. Why do bad things happen to good families? Well, there's no, there's no context to that. Yeah. Um, so we were like any family. We spent uh, times at the, at the cottage, which was a huge piece. And the cottage, as people know, is in the middle of nowhere with no power and outhouses. And Philip loved it. Philip loved it because he could fish. He could catch frogs. He could... Um, you know, do all the things around nature that he loved. And so um, he he would spend time there with us, although he didn't like the work. He did not like the work, but he liked the play, right? <laughs> we're kids. <laughs> that was like but, well, yeah, but he was at. So, um, so anyway, life was pretty normal. But the things about Philip that we certainly knew that people might not have known is, is that his world was different. Life was often unfair. So you could give him something and he might still not think it's enough. Um, he just, his you'd watch a movie and his perception might be very different than ours. And, yeah. and we often wondered about that, right? Yeah. In terms of his, his world. And so, but each and every one of us is unique. And so you have to um, go with that. And, and, and getting him or understanding how, him, how he could be happy was sometimes a struggle from, from the get-go when I talk about when he was born to as he grew. So then we move into the teenage years and you guys all have teenagers and know what that's like. And so again, we're dealing with all those same kinds of influences, peer pressure, changing moods, uh, friends that maybe as they go to high school, you're not so sure about. So we did see all of that and with some concern uh, because we saw some some things that we weren't comfortable with. Um, the school did talk to us about um, his defiance in the sense of him being very um, uh, strong within himself. Not that he was destructive by any means, but so we actually, um, we took him to counseling. We did and we made that a very special thing with Bob and I, uh, his brothers weren't even involved, didn't know about it. And he actually felt pretty special. Remember yeah. that? Um, but, but I'll tell you, and I'm in the field when they said, um, is he throwing TVs? Uh, and we go, no. Is he beating up on his brothers? We said, no. Um, and so he went to some, some counseling sessions on his own. And at the end they said, you have a quiet boy. And we said, we know that. <laughs> we know he's sensitive and he's quiet, but there's something there, but we just weren't quite quite sure. So, um, so those were sort of the teenage years. His love of baseball was huge. He knew the stats. I mean, our whole house is baseball, but he really studied it. He studied it, studied it, loved it. And then in um, 2003, the fall, he turned 16 and Bob turned 50. Um, and with me and Steve Bird, we were able to get them to the World Series in Florida. Wow. This was the chance of a lifetime. Amazing. The two of them. And I know people said to us, when you say people say crazy things, they said, how do your, how do your other boys feel? Are they jealous? And we said, no. In fact, they were so happy that we found something that Philip would be so happy about. And, and you guys... Had a great trip. Oh, we had a great trip. Yeah, just the two of them. It was wonderful. So uh, then after that, the winter was, we saw some definite changes in terms of his, he only had a few friends, but they started, he started to withdraw. And and we know even to this day, they his friends keep in touch a little bit with us about wondering why, why did he withdraw? And, and we tried to 
reach that door. But Philip was, again, look at life a little differently and getting him to talk as any normal teenager is really difficult, but for him, a real, real struggle. Hmm. We then go to the summer of 2004 and we have a big family wedding at the cottage and he's going, I'm not going. And we said, this is the family, it's just the family. We actually were bringing boatloads of people in. So he did that. And then um, the wedding reception didn't want to go. And we said, but this is again a family thing. And what people don't know, and I'll, I'll mention this in a few minutes, is Bob was quite ill at the time of all of this. And not that many people know that part of the story. So I said, when dad is ready to go, you go. And so I remember being at the wedding right soon as dinner was ready, finished, Bob came to me and said, I got to go home. And I put my hand on Philip's shoulder and I said, dad's ready. And he was up like a flash, like, get me out of here. I don't want to be around people. Um, then three weeks later, on July 22nd, 2004, Philip died by suicide at home. Unimaginable. Yeah. Um, it was a shock. It, well, it was chaos. It was a shock. It was all of those things that when we go back in that time, see different flashes of different things. What I will tell you is, is that we were immediately surrounded by friends. Kathy and Steve were there in a flash and our other neighbors, Paul, Paul. Macarath. Paul oh, Macarath yeah. laid with Bob and Philip for I don't know how long. Karen was here. So we were immediately in the chaos had this this warmth and this cloak around us there, there was there was no questions asked and and the paramedics were amazing because they they allowed us to bring the car through the through the field yeah. and they actually drove around the bases that was wow. the last drive around the bases so the neighbors couldn't see and, and everything. So the privacy was in, amazing. Um, we certainly got through the next three days with God's presence, God's arms around us, all of those things. Um, I was able to speak, you were able to speak, Christian was able to speak. We honored Philip in a way that um, was worthy of him. And, and we were conscious of not making it this big, thing it was because of how he was around crowds and so forth so we got through that piece and then the next day i called the ambulance to get bob to the hospital mark our youngest is going i've just lost my brother am i going to lose my father and i kept saying we are going to do this we will and we again were surrounded by prayers so got him to the hospital and, and had some frustrations there and then um, got him to uh, Mount Sinai where he had surgery and so forth. Um, that was like coming to heaven. That was like, oh my gosh, we are gonna get the help that we need. Again, I know Karen and Paul were back here asking for prayer, for surgery, for, for things to work through, yeah. which they did. So we get back home and so it's a couple months later I have gone back to work because as crazy, I was working for Red Cross at that time, as crazy as it was, and I wasn't happy with my job, but sometimes you need the normal to feel because it was so unnormal. Yeah. Um, and we're sitting around the, the table and, and it's still, it's we don't know what to do. And Karen had given me the name of the counselor and said, um, when you're ready, call. So I'm sitting up with Bob and I said, I gotta make this call. And at six o'clock, I know that I'm only gonna get an answering machine. So I dial, this is through Urban Good, and this amazing voice picks up. And I said, and hello, can I help you? And I said, it's Linda Fleming and blah, blah, blah. And she says, this is Dina. She said, I've been waiting for your call. I've been waiting for your call. And it was just like, so from then on, um, 
things just went into place in terms of we were five years with Dina. The boys were involved with some of that, but she taught us first how to deal with the trauma, the whole piece around the brain and the mental health piece, because the whys still come. Yeah. I mean, the whys still come. As parents, we felt we were good parents, but why couldn't we see more signs than we did? Um, but she got us through the trauma, then the grief, and then how do we keep Philip in our life? And that was an amazing piece that she did. Um, and then how do we move, um, you know, we were talking about this earlier today, not past, but just how do we move forward? How do you just inch along, find those joys in life? Um, so she really carried us through that. Um, how, to, how to build rituals, like we do a, a ritual every year for, for the, uh, at the cottage where his life was. So um, I think for us, as we move forward, we've gotten into suicide prevention, we've gotten into, um, you know, dispelling the myths and the stigma. And the stigma. Um, so yeah, so that's, I mean, we are in Philip's room here. There's lots of yeah. of him, yeah. I know on, on your Facebook every year, you you take a picture and then you have pictures that you're holding of Philip. And he's yeah. definitely definitely very much yeah. part of your your life mm -hmm. still. Yeah. I was deeply impacted um, in your story um, the last time you told it when you said, uh, you know, we were talking with people in a grief group that you were a part of, yes. and um you wondered how people could get through it without faith yeah um and you know how how do people get it through get through it without the the church family wrapping their arms around you and uh the hope that christ can bring to us in the midst of trauma and yeah. um what, what how did your faith get you through this how did that help in this journey for you guys? Um, I mean, our, I guess, I mean, our faith was, was unconditional for sure. Like, and so it wasn't tied to anything. So when, when this happened, I mean, I mean, being mad at God was the last thing. I mean, it didn't even, it, it, it wasn't, wasn't part of the equation. It just never was. So uh, how did it get, how did it get through us? It was just, basically our belief in God and that he would um, he would he was he was walking alongside us I mean we certainly felt that were we in pain absolutely are we still in pain yeah um, but we never we never felt forsaken or dumped or you know by him and so we felt that strong presence I mean I've never I've, when I was in the hospital I'd never felt prayer to the extent that I, I had yeah. at that time. Yeah. It, it was very strong. And so just our belief in in God and him walking alongside us and just the people that were presenting themselves to us to help us was, was just part of the package that God was presenting to us. Mm -hmm. And we also believe that there, there, there is a reason. We don't know why this happened to us. I mean, you can jump to all kinds of conclusions, kind of like with Job, and, and just, you know, you must have done something wrong. You, you, you know, you, you're paying for it now. This, you know, you're in trouble, kind of thing. And, and um, for us, it was just, it was just, uh, um, just our strength just helped us go through it and we felt that there was there was a requirement there was something that we needed to do to honor that and we i think we both felt that that there was there was a purpose in this and i'm trying to stay away from the word the words you know everything happens for a reason because yeah. Yeah. yeah i think the lies come you know like joe's friends said those lies to him that it was his fault that something had gone wrong and and in these moments we can all struggle with that like I, I think it's a real piece to have to walk through so 
like obviously your true north was your relationship with Jesus and your uh, your faith in God uh, and the presence of his spirit in the hospital for you in that time, the presence that you felt knowing that people were praying for you and calling out to God on your behalf, his spirit being present. But um, how, how did you not believe the lies? Like what made you be able to like obviously his grace in part i'm sure but like what like well i i guess i could answer that chris in the sense of that i I've, I've just always believed that because i've had a lot of trauma in my life even before this yeah. and so i realized early on that it's it's not about me it's about my and I, I could not read you one scripture out of the Bible, I am sorry to say, but my belief and my strength in his um, love and grace has always been. And, and you know what? I remember as a kid, I think I said this in my testimony, I would go to church and I felt like I was just one of his children. I can remember dancing around with my friends saying this and they're going, are you crazy? And I never believed that I was crazy. And so I I think that God in this instance with Philip um, just kept wrapping his arms around. Now, were we angry? Absolutely. We were saddened. We were struck with grief, all of those things. But did we feel angry at God? No. And like you say, in that group, we were sitting there looking at each other going, oh, my gosh, what are we going to say? Because the anger... But we also knew that people in that room didn't know who God was. Yeah. Yeah. And somehow, somehow we did, or we do, or whatever. And so it's 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 hard to explain that, but um, yeah, so. Yeah. You know, all this, um, in the early months and, and in the early years, you, you must've had a lot of people asking questions or giving advice. I, yeah. yeah. I, I ran out of a lot of grocery stores in those days. <laughs> I will tell you right now, <laughs> if I saw somebody, some days I could do it and some days I couldn't. And Bob was too, was still recovering. And so I would, I, on a couple of occasions, left a full load of groceries because I couldn't. And so I knew, I knew instinctively who I could, who my people were. And I said that earlier, um, and I do this in my work. I mean, surround yourself with the people that you know will be your people, the good listeners, unconditional, love you no matter what. We didn't certainly have any answers at all. Um, we actually um, went, one of Philip's best, his best friend, um, who, who may still be struggling today and we connect, um, we went with him to his counselor as he was trying to, to go through that. And, and um, it was just the opposite experience that we had with, with Dina, because we were, we felt badly for him because she was kind of. We almost felt like we were counseling the counselor. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was, it was, Our knowledge it, base had just grown about suicide. Yeah. And, you know, you keep in mind too, that we were, we're also trying to destigmatize it. Right. It's, right. it's, it is a huge stigma. Yeah. 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 Can you can you speak more about that? Um, yeah. yeah. Even, even in our yeah. own family, I mean, even the word, and again, it's it's through the work that I'm doing is is commit. I mean, it, that's that's a pretty strong word. And so, yeah. you know, Philip died by suicide. It was a mental health illness, that kind of thing. So, I wouldn't say that we do any hard sells, but we do yeah. it by role modeling and by making people aware. And um, there are a lot of hurting people out there. Did we know that Philip was in that much pain? No. Yeah. Yeah. Do we know that now? <clears throat> yeah. And even when Dina, the light bulb went on for us a little bit when she, we spent a whole counseling session on the brain and we're going, wow, that, that really does make some sense when you looked at, when you backstory that. So um, I've learned to listen to people if, if they're off on that different rant and you know what people, you just kind of go by example, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. 
mental health is such a major issue um, that we're walking through and learning so much about and need to know so much more about. And I think um, when it comes to the Christian community and uh, suicide and the stigma around it, I think there's a lot for people to learn around mental health and um, what it means to journey with people in the midst of the pain of what they're going through and their experiences. And I, I'm just so thankful that we can just have an open and honest conversation about this um, because I know it's helping many people to just say, hey, um, I need to reach out. I need to have a conversation. I, you know, maybe somebody's watching right now and they're having thoughts of suicide. You've contemplated it. You've walked through it in your mind. You've played it out and you need to talk to somebody. And we want you to know that we're here for you, that we love you and that we're going to help you get the help that you need if you reach out. And so we want to encourage you to do that. You can email us at questions at wmbchurch.ca or text 226-476-3053. We want to help as a church community. We love you. And we want to stop this pain from happening in more families. And uh, reach out to us, please. Yeah. I know I there's many in our community that have reached out to me during this COVID season of these thoughts and the pain that they're going through. And I, I want to encourage you that you're not alone and that you're loved. Yeah. yeah. I, I think back to when I mentioned earlier about the counselor and saying, you know, he's really quiet. And they're going, yeah, we know that. And that's a really nice quality about him, right? Um, and so um, certainly we, we learned a lot around the whole issue around mental health and understanding um, that you can ask those questions that we as, as parents, we're afraid to ask, which I think many parents are, um, and 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 having that dialogue is is huge. And so, um, certainly, I've been asked since then to to connect with people who are might be journeying along that, um, and and certainly with the suicide prevention council as well. So, yeah. 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 Robin Suraz makes a great comment here, just about. Bob feeling the prayers of people and reminding all of us that we have a role to play. One thing you could do today is to pray for those in our community that are struggling with mental health issues right now and that they would reach out and get the help that they need, but also uh, to pray for strength for all of them and, uh, and to know that that actually makes a difference in the lives of people. That's one practical step to start with right now. Yeah. 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 I was just going to go back to the piece, Paul, that you brought up about uh, people saying the, the darndest thing. And so, you know, they would say, you know, the whys, which we still wonder about the whys. Those, those don't go away. But sort of the anger and, um, you know, we did have people in our group that were very angry at system things, whether it's yeah. the school or those kinds of things. And we didn't buy into that did we no yeah no. yeah and there was a lot of anger and and why weren't people doing and why weren't the signs and that kind of thing and um not to say that we were were okay to say this is what happened but again it brings it back to um trusting in god and 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 being able to 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 move forward did we want this to happen absolutely not but anger didn't take over no, n never did. And, you know, just to comment on like people saying things and, and you know, they can be hurtful. But, yes. Yeah. But we just never, I guess we just never looked at it from that aspect. I mean, anybody who came to the visitation wasn't coming there to hurt us. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what do you say? You know, I mean, Every time you go to a funeral, you, what do you say to somebody? And and sometimes you say something that's maybe not um, comforting or whatever. But I just well, we both look at it that you know somebody's there. They 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 said the wrong thing for the reason. Yeah, yeah, some of that. Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what people are hurting themselves 
don't know how to process, don't know what to say. I, I will, you know, new pastors often, uh, Karen West and I have had conversations, one of the most common questions we get from a new pastor is, what do I say when I go to the funeral home? How do I comfort people? Where do I find the answers? I don't know where to find the answers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in those moments, we have to look to God's word. We have to trust the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. But most of all, people want to know we love them and that we're present. And, and I think, you know, just saying, hey, I'm, I'm here with you and I love you. And if there's something I can do to help, I, you know, I, I, I'm probably there's nothing, but <laughs> I, yeah. I, I do love you, you know. Yeah. And I yeah. think that presence is a big piece of it to uh, to just say to people, you don't actually have to have the answers. And sometimes when you pretend you do, you create more hurt than benefit. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Were, were there other things that you can recall that were helpful in that season? Comments that, that people made? Well, just to back up a little bit, with when the day that Philip died, I mean, with Paul McRae here, like he he was here in in no time. I think Steve Bird called him, and and uh, I mean he spent a lot of time with me, mm -hmm. <clears throat> trying to comfort me. And then when Philip, when it was time for Philip to leave, um, Paul prayed over it. And John fourteen, we've heard it. Every time you go to a funeral, people pick that passage to say. Um, and to me, it, it was just, it wasn't personal. It was just, it was scripture and I didn't, not that I didn't pay attention to it, but it just didn't have a meaning for it. And then when he, he read it, but that day, um, the particular line of, of in my father's house, there are many rooms i felt immediately immediately that felt was safe yeah yeah it's beautiful yeah, yeah. yeah. i have a hard time talking about crying no that's yeah yeah and and that's no real. i mean that emotional and spiritual support was ever so present with, with paul and karen but I mean, the practicalities of people, we don't have family that live here. Um, and so our friends are our family here in Waterloo. And they, as I said, were immediately, but they housed our, our family. They fed our family. They, they just, it was like clockwork. They, people just did things and it allowed us to just be. And Bob, of course, was, was very ill at the time. And so, um, we had meals for, I think, two weeks solid. Um, well, A, Bob went to the hospital, so and I was in Toronto. But, Sorry, I'll go yeah. <laughs> but, um, but people just, um, like we all do, like WMB does embrace, and our neighbors just just did for people, um, what did for us, what I think anybody would do. But we, we immediately felt blessed and loved. And, um, yeah. and that's all. It was all. just so powerful. Yeah. It was yeah. so powerful yeah. the, the way the way the community just stepped up and and not that we asked for things they just saw things and that is the difference. Yeah. <laughs> if you know if somebody is just doing stuff for you and and like seeing your needs and you're not saying what you, what your requirements are and it just shows up as opposed to me saying well you know what we need. To have this done and that done and somebody does it not that it's it's any less it's just more meaningful when somebody actually is paying attention yeah. to and anticipating yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's god working through people in our lives truly truly oh, yeah. reaching into our lives with his love and his presence you know showing us that that he knows our need as matthew 6 tells us before we even say it and, uh, and and we'll meet those needs that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I wrote down my words of wisdom, Paul. Okay. Okay. So my my wisdom words are 
Um, one foot in front of the other. Uh, no God is near. Surround yourself with the people who listen, support, and are positive. Go with the emotions, the crying, the laughing, the screaming, the hollering, whatever those emotions are, they are real. Emotions aren't either right nor wrong. They are real and how we channel those are so important. Um, always remember your loved one. Um, Philip is still very present in our lives. We, we celebrate his birthday still. He loved to go to watch a ball game in a, in a restaurant or at home and have hot dogs. So we pretty much do that. Now it's just Bob and I, the boys used to do that. Um, we honor him every, we, we have placed him at the cottage in a place so fitting for him by where he um, fished and uh, he can see out, but people cannot see in. It's through the creek between the pond and the lake. And so it's kind of nestled. So he can see out, but people can't see in. And that's so, so Philip. Um, and honoring, inviting him to our table always and, and, and talking about him. That, um, because many people might feel uncomfortable with this. Even people early on, you asked early on, yeah. would mention his name and say, oh, oh, we shouldn't talk about him. And I'm going, of course you should. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that goes back to that fear. And I actually, yeah. So yeah, those, those are things. So I don't yeah. know what your words of wisdom are. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't spend any time. <laughs> 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 well, that. <laughs> your words of wisdom have just been sharing. Yeah. <laughs> With honesty, no, yeah. it truly has been. So, yeah. Like you said, as an example, uh, you know, to share and to embrace uh, the feelings and to to be honest about them. I think that's so much of our as humans. Sometimes we're we're just we want to hide all those things from one another uh, for whatever reason it is. We we do. Yeah, I mean that's human nature is to hide all that stuff, and especially when it comes to it's messy. To, to, yeah, we don't like messy, right? Who does? And in our case, mental health is, you know, that's what we're dealing, that, that's the issue that we're dealing with, right? And suicide being one of those components of mental health. And, and probably in my mind anyways, probably the, the worst of, of the uh, um, uh, uh, taboos, you know, you just don't talk about that. In, in days gone by, if you, um, uh, if you had a suicide in the family, the neighborhood would come in to your house and take all the pictures down of that individual. Mm. Right. And, and actually in our, in our sessions with, uh, with Dina, there was one woman there that her, her mother-in-law came in and took all the pictures of her son. Down. Like he never existed. Right. And oh, Philip did this. Yeah. And, and so, he does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're really strong about, it's no different than talking about Winston Churchill. He died and we still talk about him, you know. Right. Phillips at Winston Churchill's level, but I'm just saying that he's a human being and we need to keep talking about people no matter how they left. Yeah. And because it just, it helps. Yeah. To throw Philip aside, I could not. Have, I couldn't, even though I'm having, I'm struggling speaking, I could never have gotten to this stage yeah. by dumping him and saying he's never existed. He did exist. And my first, my first uh, encounter with that was in the hospital. How many children do you have? How many children do you have? Somebody came and said, how many children do you have? And I said, two. Mm. And I have three. Yeah. But I said, two. And I, I regret that. Yeah. So, so now, so now I'm 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 very conscious of saying three. Yeah. You know, and and then you know people will push the envelope sometimes and say, well, so what do they do? You know, how old are they? And I go, well, the oldest is this, and the youngest is this. So you bypass that, but. But then there's always some guy listening, right? And he goes, so yeah. what about the middle chap? Yeah. 
And but you, then that's the opportunity where you but share. That, but that's the opportunity of a person that's actually wanting to share and it's not super. Yeah. yeah, they want to hear. They want to listen. Yeah. yeah. So one of the the challenges that many families at our church are going through with a family member struggling with mental health, whether it be a parent in the household struggling with mental health or another child, is how to talk about it as a family. And um, how, how does it look for you and Christian and Mark to talk about the mental health challenges that Philip had in your family? and? Um, is that a conversation that you talk about, or would you have advice for families right now in our church? That's We're struggling right now, I'm <laughs> trying to figure out how to have that conversation when mom or dad or one of the kids is. Yeah. Is. Um, yeah. yeah. I'll be honest. It's not a conversation that we certainly talk with the boys about Philip all the time, and we told them what we were doing today because we were uh, on Skype with both of them last night, but the whole um, mental health piece, I would say, I would say Mark more than Christian. Mm -hmm. um, we've had those conversations a little bit. Would I encourage it? Absolutely. I think we were kind of not at that stage. And to be honest, um, you know, I think Philip and, and or Christian and Mark processed it very differently. I think Christian, I would love for him to have more conversations with it, but he was the oldest and he was in charge and the most mature and, and you wonder what's, yeah. what's there for sure. And Mark, I think is a little more open to that and, and has gone through counseling himself. Mm -hmm. So they kind of did their own thing. Mm -hmm. And so to talk, we, we've never really had that, really big conversation happening. No. And yeah, for for reasons of when we do start going down that road, it's very, very hard. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's lots of crying and and and, and you tend to shut down, right? Yeah. yeah. And so and when you see your kids crying, you so you, you back off, you pull away, you do whatever you need you need to do to kind of survive the conversation, right? You, you don't want to go. You don't want it to go too far south, yeah. right? But there is a difference with the two boys. I mean, I mean, Christian is able to to hold on a lot tighter. Mark, not so much. Mark's more like me and just unable to speak when when you hit those points. And so it just makes it very difficult to to speak. I mean, not that you don't want to share. It's just it just becomes very difficult to share. Right? So. Yeah. But I, I do encourage opening those doors and, and you have to open up the doors. Yeah. And you know what? If there's one thing to say is don't be afraid to ask your child. If, yeah. yeah. If they have uh, thought about it. Yeah. If they have thought about uh, harming themselves. Because asking that question, it's a misnomer. If you're asking, if you think asking that question is going to going to lead to the next step, nothing's further from the truth. Yeah, right. it's 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 showing care. Yeah, showing um, uh, not not showing anything is not showing anything. I mean, there's no concern. There's, there's if if I don't think about it, it's not going to happen. If you know, if I close my eyes, the car accident won't happen. Well, it will. It's just you know, it, it's just such a stigma. It's yeah. the hardest one. And I feel that the, this whole mental health stigma right today is the same as when when we were kids. Um, back in the 70s, you never said anybody had cancer. It was the C word and you hit it. And now we're running for it. Yeah. You know, we're running for breast cancer. I mean, that was like super taboo in the 70s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And I find that mental health is in that time now in that, in that point of time yeah, right. we just have to get through it we have to talk about it we have to normalize it it's we have to open the dialogue and conversation and the bravery of moments like this where we tear down those walls and say no we're not going to keep this in the dark any longer we're going to bring it into the light yeah. i think so often um, conversations don't happen because 
um, it, it's the elephant in the room that we all know is there, but we're just not willing to talk about. And I think we have to acknowledge that it's there, that it's present and open up the dialogue and conversation for people because we all need to talk. And I think the pain uh, of life and the stories and circumstances that people go through when they have to endure it alone because they're not allowed to talk about it because they're not allowed to express it and process what's going on. Yeah. Wow, we, we don't get to learn from each other. We don't get to realize that, that so much of the suffering we go through other people have endured and found ways to walk in the midst of it. And your story today has certainly done that. It's a real gift to all of us. And so Bob and Linda, thank you yeah. for the grace that uh, you've given to all of us in telling your story um, because it's a healing bomb, I think, for many that are listening and thinking about, hey, I've got a friend, I need to reach out and just and ask where you're at. I've got a, a family member. We need to have that conversation. Um, I need to start praying for them more. I need to um, not wait. I need to take a step. And so I, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. It's 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 difficult, but it's a necessity. Yeah. We can't shy away from it. So. Yeah. Linda, I know that you've uh, just submitted a chapter to a book. You want to tell us a little I bit did. about that? Um, a woman, and I, you know, my story doesn't compare to. Uh, it's a woman at work that I work with that has had lost two children, has lost two children, one in a tragic accident and one um, to, uh, I think, brain cancer. Anyway, um, she approached me and she's now retired and it's called Letters of the Club. It's 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 moms who it, it's really focused on moms who have lost lost a child. And so we've got anywhere from someone that lost a child um, stillbirth to uh, one woman lost three, unbelievably situation. So we each have a chapter. So I just I just did finish that. So I'm not sure when it, it will take a while. I think to publish, but yeah. um, but it is about finding and and part of it was to what can what advice can we give to moms who have lost a child? Yeah. And so it was a good opportunity to share. Yeah. I think you said it was called Letters to the Sisters Club. Letters to the Sisters Club, I think, is what it's yeah. called. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And in a couple of weeks, um, Karen West is going to come on uh, on Wednesday and share some of her journey with right. infertility and, and and a failed adoption, and then um, mm -hmm. perhaps some of the, the uh, struggle or challenges that she's had as she's walked with her children and now the grandchildren uh, through right. some of these uh, losses. So yeah, yeah. Well, Bob and Linda, thank you. Uh, echo Chris's uh, what he just mm -hmm. said. Thank you for sharing. Um, we know that this will be healing for people mm -hmm. listening, and it will be an encouragement for them. But thank you for putting yourself out there to do that. I know it's uh, it, it can feel costly and um, exhausting at times, mm -hmm. but uh, but it is an important conversation to have. And yeah. I'm very, yes. very grateful for you to share your story so You're honestly. Welcome. Thank you. Let me pray yeah, Chris. Uh, for us. Father, we thank you for Philip's life. We thank you for the gift that he was to the family, to friends, to other kids at school and teachers, to the church. We thank you for the time that they had to enjoy all of who he was. And Father, we thank you for your incredible love for him and your uh, understanding in the midst of all of this, even when we don't understand that you've always been present, that you are always with them in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, thank you for Bob and Linda today. Would you place your healing balm on them again as they've opened up this wound and they've shared their story with us? And Father, as Paul said, this is costly, Lord, we know. So would you touch them? Would you remind them that we love them, that Again, we are present, that you are present, and that bringing this up will help so many in this similar circumstance. And so, Father, thank you. And Lord, would you help those who are struggling with mental health, who are 
wondering right now to reach out, to reach out to loved ones, to family, to friends, to the church, to tell someone what they're going through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. So I've just put up the uh, a contact information. If you do want to reach out, anyone that's listening, um, we'll get back to you uh, very quickly. If you uh, have some challenges that you want to talk about, or if in, in general, if you want to ask questions, that's our, our question line as well. Um, we'll be back next week with Philip and Robin Serez, <laughs> who are going to be sharing with their journey around Philip's uh, diagnosis with ALS and uh, the tension in that it is to walk with uh, between preparing for the end of life, but also living fully and trusting God uh, for healing. And so this, this tension that they're walking right now, and we look forward to hearing that story. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob and Linda, again, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, yeah. It's been a blessing uh, for sure. Thank you. So Thanks, everyone will sign off for now. Bye for now. Thank you for Bye. joining us. Thank you. Everyone, thank you. Yeah.